Good morning. Good morning. We are going to get started with the occupational adaptation model. Um, yet another model that looks at occupation in person um, and the importance of environment. <clears throat> So hopefully, um, after going through this lecture, we understand occupational adaptation as both a normal process. Um, it's something, it's a process that, that everybody goes through when they have to adapt. Um, but we also, as therapists, can facilitate that adaptation process um, to help facilitate change with our clients for the better. So hopefully we can be familiar with the model concepts. What is a person? What is an occupation? What are the environments? Um, describe what change occurs in the OA model or where that is supposed to occur at. Um, explore OA model outcomes. What do we hope um, to achieve with our clients? And then applying our OA clinical reasoning um, to a case scenario. And I, I came up with an activity um, for you guys to, um, to work with. So occupational adaptation was developed by Jeanette Gady and Sally Schultz from the Texas Women's University um, in 1992. And so they initially developed it as a guiding framework for their PhD program, which I, I think was interesting. So it wasn't initially made to help clinical practice like some of our others, like PEO and, and some of those place or some of those things. Um, but it, again, it was meant to um, place emphasis on or identify that normative process for how people adapt. And so I think even in education, um, students having to adapt um, while they learn, right? How do they learn new things? How do they, um, how do they juggle schedules? How do they juggle personal lives? How do they juggle everything that's going on? And, um, and we have to adapt in order to succeed. And so some people have a harder time with that than others. And so the overall goal of OA was to improve um, that systematic process of how can we get our clients to feel comfortable adapting um, and increasing their overall performance. So when we look at the concepts, the person, um, a person is made up of, and we'll go over these um, in greater detail, but a person is made up of sensory motor component, a cognitive component, and a psychosocial component, okay? So <clears throat> the person, again, um, experiences senses, we move, we have those motor skills, we're interpreting all of our senses all at once, um, and sort of helps our coordination. Cognitive, again, I had talked about learning and adapting and learning to adapt. Um, so there's a really heavy cognitive component to this model. How we think, how we learn, how we process. There's also a psychosocial component, so how well we interact with others. Um, human occupation um, encompasses um, work, Okay, so any occupational challenge, anything that we're faced to do um, could be with work, could be with play or leisure, um, and it can be from self-care. And so your occupations are going to deter be determined by um, what's expected out of your roles, right? Your expected roles from being a student, a mother, a brother, a father, a son, um, all of those roles will, will impact your occupations of work, play, or self-care. Your environments are going to be a physical environment, a social environment, and also cultural um, will be considered part of the environment. And now again, where we focus on this model, the, the components that we want to change to help our patient is to provide them with opportunities to complete occupation um, and to have them go through this internal adaptation process okay and so we'll talk about that a little more 
the overall outcome is to allow greater ease for them to adapt to various situations, um, which is going to increase their adaptive capacity or ability to adapt um, and achieve mastery over what they're trying to achieve. So some key terms, adaptive capacity and relative mastery. And so as you saw in the previous slide, the constants that stay the same, we have person on one side, um, we have an occupational environment on the other side, and then that occupational challenge um, is what creates an interaction between the person and the environment. What we can assume about a person is a person is an occupational being and they want to do good, okay? So I'm sure all of you guys want to be good students. You all want to be good daughters and siblings and, and um, sons and, and husbands and wives and, and whatever your roles may be. You want to be good at it. You have that internal drive and desire to be good at it, to, to master um, your occupations. Um, as I mentioned before, um, every person is made up of sensory motor, cognitive, and psychosocial subsystems. Okay, now those subsystems are based on genetics, right? So if I'm just a clumsy person with my sensory motor skills, right, that could have some genetic component to it. Maybe my parents were clumsy also. Um, environmental. Okay, so maybe um, my sensory motor skills aren't as refined because environmentally I wasn't exposed to uh, many age-appropriate developmental toys to facilitate that development. Okay, and then phenomenological is just simply um, an experience. Okay, so maybe I didn't have um, the ability to have certain experiences that facilitated my motor skills, okay? Maybe I couldn't play football. Maybe I couldn't, didn't have exposure to soccer or uh, maybe I didn't have um, some kind of experience that would have facilitated my, my development of that. So maybe that, that would affect even uh, my awareness of how else I could perform an occupation. So as OTs, we need to play a part or we need, to, we need to pay attention to the sensory motor part, right? We need to pay attention to the cognitive and psychosocial part of a person so that we're, we're implementing a well-rounded, holistic um, evaluation and, and intervention. Another constant is occupation. And as I mentioned before, it includes work, play or leisure, and self-care. And so the properties of your occupations are going to actively involve the person. Okay, so the person has to actively be doing something. Um, they have to be meaningful to the person. Um, and they have to involve a process with some kind of a product. Okay, involve a process with a product. And so um, as I'm completing my self-care skills, Right, I'm going through a routine, I'm going through my process of how I get myself ready for the day, um, and I'm interacting with certain products, right? Like my clothing, my toothpaste, my toothbrush. Um, and so some of, those, some of those products can be tangible or they can be intangible, okay? So they can be like physical objects or um, maybe they can be something that, that isn't quite as, as tangible. When we're looking at occupational environments, and remember our occupations are work, play, leisure, and self-care. And so our environment is more physical, social, and cultural. Okay, so where we're completing our occupations are going to be relating to work, play, leisure, and self-care. So looking at the physical subsystem. So the physical environment is going to include your time, your space, your materials that you need for completing your occupations, um, the location. Your social subsystems are going to be perhaps those interpersonal connections or interactions that you make within that particular setting. So maybe it's in the classroom, right, where you're having that interpersonal interaction. 
Your cultural subsystem is going to include values, morals, ethics, standards, rules, communication methods, sort of those underlying rules of the road that we know to be true or that we follow, that we value um, together as a group. Okay, so those cultural subsystems kind of give us those rules of the road to follow. Everybody shows up to class on time, everybody um, wears clothes, everybody has some type of grooming and hygiene, right? Um, those kinds of things. There are six principles of occupational adaptation. Um, the person, again, being an occupational being, has a desire to master their environment. And this happens when they participate in occupations. Okay, so a person wants to do good with their occupations. They have to do their occupations in an environment. Okay, that makes sense. The occupational environment demands mastery from the person. Okay, so there are things in the environment that either enable or restrict somebody's ability to participate. Okay, that's a, a pretty similar concept we've heard in other models. Um, the person's level of mastery and so their ability, whatever ability they have, and the environment's demand creates a press. Okay, so again, the person wants to do good, but they may not have the necessary abilities to do it in an environment that's set up a certain way. Okay, and so that creates a press. I think of it like a pressure, like, oh my gosh, I really want to bathe, but I have hip precautions and I can't get in and out of my tub. Um, and so there's that restriction in my environment that's preventing me from being successful with bathing. So to navigate that press between what they can do and what the environment is inhibiting, they go through a normative and developmental process of adapting, okay? So it's a completely normal process when faced with new things, with new, um, new challenges, right? We want to rise to the occasion. Um, and so again, that person desire, they have that motivation to do that occupation, okay? And they do that occupation in, in whatever environment they can. The environment is going to have demands or challenges in place for the person. And so when the person and the occupational environment are going on during that occupation, right, there's a, a, that press for mastery. And so that press is going to depend on your roles, right? So um, maybe, maybe your role is just simply to um, get better after a surgery, right, so that you can pick up um, taking care of your home, being a homemaker, um, those kinds of things. And so that press of being able to bathe, being able to cook, being able to get dressed, all of those things um, after a hip replacement is going to be putting a press on you based on following those precautions, based on your pain um, and how your home is set up. There's going to be a level of occupational challenge, okay? So there's going to be a challenge. Something's going to be um, difficult. Um, Again, your occupational role and your role demands or expectations um, are probably going to be affected. Um, how you respond to your occupations, your occupational response, okay, is going to also play a part. So how are you going to, how have you usually done your bathing and your dressing and your cooking? Um, and are you able to do that now? So usually there's some kind of a challenge that's preventing you from doing things the way you used to do. I'm going to take a, a moment here and something that helps me to understand this model because there's a lot of terms, right? And so um, I'm going to show a diagram um, 
that again is very, very, very helpful for me to understand what's going on in this model. Um, I have a blank one um, that I, I provided for you on Canvas. So as you're studying um, and you're studying these terms, um, you can try and fill them in where they would go in the diagram. Okay, and then um, that way you just you know what is occurring where and what's occurring um, in each area. Okay, because it, it, again, it's, it's very rambly in those sorts of things, this, this particular model. So let me stop sharing here. And let me do another screen share. This takes so long. Okay, so this is the, the template I have. And so we see on the far left side, right, we have our elements, our three main elements. So the left-hand side is the person. The middle is the interaction between the person and the environment. Okay, and so a person, and so what I would write in this little box, and I do have my completed one there that helped me even in preparing for this lecture today. Um, it, it just helped me know where I was going with each PowerPoint slide and, and it gets a little jumbled, um, but hopefully, hopefully it helps. So underneath the person here, a person has that desire for mastery. Okay, so in this circle here, I probably would put desire for mastery. Um, on the other side, we have your occupational environment. Your occupational environment provides a demand for mastery. Okay, so there are demands within that environment. So then the person interacting with the environment um, is that press for mastery. Okay, so this creates a, a press, meaning the person wants to, has, has the motivation to complete their occupation, but the environment probably has some things um, standing in the way. So from the person or from the press here, when you go down, um, there would be occupational challenge, right? So the environment or maybe part of the person is go and creates a press and that press is going to have some sort of occupational challenge, okay? It's a little rectangle underneath the middle circle. So when the occupational challenge presents itself, like something's challenging here, I really wanna do this occupation, but it, it's, it's a challenge, I can't quite do it yet. Okay, that, cha that challenge is going to be, um, that challenge would occur based on your occupational roles and your expectations. Okay, so if you, you know, again, if you are, uh, if you are a mother, um, you know, that would impact whatever challenge, occupational challenge you have. So under in the in the middle rectangle, right in the center, right, we have occupational challenge. Okay, that's occurring from the person and the environment and that press for mastery. Okay, and that is all guided upon by your occupational roles and expectations. Okay. Are you all with me? Okay, again, I have, it, I have one filled out too, but it's a little overwhelming. Um, and I can share the one briefly. Okay, so three constants, my C got chopped off when I scanned this in, but we have a desire for mastery, which is the person. We have the occupational environment, which provides us with a demand. The interaction between those two creates a press for mastery, which presents an occupational challenge. Um, and that occupational challenge um, is guided upon by whatever roles and our expectations that we may have, okay? We've talked about the person, so I guess we can go into the person. Um, the person is, again, underneath the left-hand side, uh, has a desire for mastery, and the three parts of the person include sensory motor, cognitive, and psychosocial. Okay, and so all three of those parts of the person 
and how a person performs also is going to affect um, that occupational challenge and how they interpret their roles and their role expectations. When we look at the other side, the occupational environment, which is providing us challenges, right, that demand for mastery, um, we have three occupational environments, okay, work, play leisure, and self-care. So again, any occupational challenge you may have, when we're looking at occupation, it, could, it would be related to either work, play leisure, or self-care. Okay, and all of those are going to be dependent upon what our roles are. Dr. Lawson, were you aware that um, you're not screen sharing right now and we can just see you? If you know that, that's great. But I just no, to make sure I that didn't we... know that. I'm sorry. There we go. Yeah, I was just going along here. Um, so we have desire for mastery, press for mastery, demand for mastery. Um, and below the desire for mastery, we have person. And then again, just to help me make sense of it, like, okay, what are the three parts of the person? Sensory motor, cognitive, psychosocial. And then on the other side, on the environment, we have three occupational environments, work, play leisure, self-care. Okay, so when those two interact with the person, right, we have sensory motor applying to the occupation of work. We have sensory motor applying to the occupation of leisure. We have sensory motor relating to the occupation of self-care. Same thing with cognitive, same thing with psychosocial, okay? And so they're all interacting, providing challenges um, and helping us meet our roles and expectations, okay? So I, we've talked about, um, we've talked about, I think, these components so far um, in the diagram. <clears throat> now let's go back to the PowerPoint. Let me check if it's sharing. Okay, I got a green go here. Good. This is where it gets a little, a little more confusing. Um, just a lot, a lot going on with the model. Um, we start having adaptive, um, adaptive responses. Okay, and so your adaptive responses. Um, again, because, because this model is looking at um, having our clients adapt so that they can meet the demands of the environment um, or they can work with what components that they have, um, we have two parts of the adaptive response generation subprocess. So there are two parts. We have the adaptation gestalt. And so this is the configuration of those three systems of the person. So psychosocial, cognitive, sensory motor, okay? And so every occupation that I'm looking at, I need to identify how much components are required from the person to meet that occupational demand. And so I think of like a little, a little round circle right, and we divide that circle into threes, a psychosocial part, a cognitive part, and a sensory motor part. So with the adaptation gestalt, um, if I am looking at my work occupation of teaching, how much in relation to the other ones, so how much psychosocial is there? Okay, how much cognitive is there? How much sensory motor is there? Okay, so I probably have a lot more um, cognitive and psychosocial in my circle, right, than, than probably sensory motor, okay? So every occupation is going to look a little differently with your adaptation gestalt. The other component of the adaptive response generation subprocess is your adaptive and disadaptive responses. And so in your adaptive responses, you have adaptive energy, you have adaptive response modes, and you have adaptive response behaviors. So when we go to the adaptive response mechanism, and we'll go over these in a little more detail here, Adaptive response mechanisms, OK, 
Okay, so that's one of the three adaptive response mechanism or um, the second one, adaptive response mechanisms. And there's three areas, right? There's adaptive energy. Well, adaptive energy is how much energy do we have to actually adapt? We can have primary energy or we can have secondary energy. So primary energy is <clears throat> when you are, let me look at my example here. When you're learning something new and you have to really think about it, okay, that expends a lot of energy, right? So when you're first learning how to drive a car and you're, okay, how does the steering wheel work? Where is the, where is the gas pedal? Um, you have to pay attention to everything and it takes so much work. It takes so much energy and then you're just completely exhausted, right? Um, so that's a form of adaptive energy is primary. Secondary is when those components um, become more automatic. Um, you've become so used to them, you've adapted to them so well um, that you're not requiring as much adaptive energy anymore. It's not as new of a process for you, so it doesn't require as much energy. Okay. Another component of the adaptive response mechanism is your adaptive response modes. And so your modes can be existing, modified, or new. Okay, so they can be existing, modified, or new. And so, again, I'm looking at my examples here. So when we're looking at our response modes, do we go with what we know works? Okay, so if I'm tying my shoes, right, I'm probably going to use, it's something that I'm familiar with, I'm probably going to use a mode where I already know how to do it. Okay, I'm going to go to my existing mode. Okay, I, it's tried and true, I know how to use it. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. When I move to, or when I can't do my shoe tying like I used to do, I'm going to have to do a new mode, okay? And that new mode is probably going to be um, scattered, a little panicky. Um, it, it's, I'm not going to, you know, I might not be successful with it right away because it's, it's, it's new. Um, it's a little disorganized. I, I sense that I'm kind of panicking a little bit because it's new and I haven't experienced it before and I don't know if it's gonna work. So then the next time you try and tie your shoe, again, you know, um, because you can't do it the way you used to do it with your existing mode, you're probably going to have to figure it out somewhere along the line and do some kind of a modified way of tying your shoe. Okay, so when you're looking at your response modes, um, and this is, this is so profound to me because anytime anybody is faced with anything new, a new challenge, they wanna, they wanna tackle it with what they know, right? They wanna, they wanna tackle it with what they know works. Um, and sometimes again, with occupational challenges, um, maybe an injury, um, to a patient. They may not be able to do their occupation like they used to do. And so they're going to be stuck and they're going to be fumbling and they're going to try um, new ways. Um, and from doing those new ways that are not successful, they're going to eventually get it and adapt and come up with a way on how to do it more modified so that they can be successful. Your adaptive response behaviors then are primitive, um, transitional, and mature. So when I think of primitive, I think of more of like that immature, right? You're, I'm responding to doing something new, adapting, and I don't like change. I don't like to adapt. I wanna do things the way I've always done them because they've always worked for me. Okay, I can't tell you how many clients I've seen that I've said, okay, um, you have to be able to put on your TED hose when you go home and you can't, you can't just put them on because you have hip precautions. 
well, then I'm not doing it. I can put my socks on any old way I want to. I'm going to do it the way I've done it for 50 years. Okay? So that would be more primitive. A little bit, little bit less mature kind of, you know, um, upset about it maybe or complaining about it. Don't know where to start even with it. You're kind of stuck in a pattern. Okay? That's, that's more of that primitive behavior. Your transitional behavior then, you'll start to become a little more open to the idea of doing it differently. Maybe a lovely nurse or case manager will say, oh, well, you can't go home. The doctor's not going to let you go home unless you get figure out how to get these Ted hose on. Well, all right, then I'll try it and they'll fumble with it a little bit with the sock aid and, and those kinds of things. Um, and then, you know, hopefully they'll transition to more of a mature adaptive response behavior. Like, you know what, this isn't my preferred way of, of putting on my sock, but it's something that I have to do, okay? And so um, maybe it's just for a short period of time. Maybe it's just to get me home. And then from there, um, I'll be able to eventually go back to the way I used to do things, okay? So those are the different ways that we respond, and these are a natural a natural order or a natural mechanism. <clears throat> I'm going to go back to my drawing, and this is where it gets a little overwhelming. Okay. So underneath the person, the person has that adaptive response generation subprocess. Okay, so there are adaptive response and it's a process. On one side, we have the adaptive gestalt. Okay, the adaptive gestalt is made up of cognitive, psychosocial, and sensory motor. So you see I have a circle here like a pie and it's cut into three sections. So what, <clears throat> whatever occupation I'm looking at, I can divide up however much, um, however many, however much component I need. Um, how much cognition do I need? How much psychosocial do I need? How much sensory motor do I need? And I can assess that or determine that um, based on what occupation I'm doing. Now, our response mechanism, our adaptive response mechanism, again, we have the energy. So we have primary or secondary energy. Primary, it's new. It takes a lot of energy out of us. It's exhausting when we learn something new or we have to do something different than what we're used to. Or there's secondary adaptive energy, where it's a little bit more automatic and it doesn't take as much energy from us. When faced with a new challenge, we have response modes. So when we're trying to figure out how to do our occupations, chances are we're gonna go to an existing mode, um, something we're already familiar with, okay? That may not work. So then maybe we're gonna try something new, a new way of doing something. So with shoe tying, maybe I had a stroke. I can't do my shoe tying the way I used to do. And I'm going to try and do it that way, even though I know I can't do it. I'm going to try it because it's the only way I've ever tied my shoes before. Okay. Okay. I can't do it. So what am I going to do? Well, let me try and just tie them with one hand. Okay. Well, I'm just twisting them. I don't know how to do it. Now I'm going to twirl them. I don't know how to do it. Now I'm going to try and just make a big dot and, um, knot. I don't know how to do it. What do I do? Right? So I'm kind of in this unorganized pattern of trying anything um, and sort of panicking here. Well, now with maybe some instruction, and you can see where a therapist comes into play here, teaching them how, giving them practice, right? And helping them figure out a different way of doing one-handed shoe tying techniques, a modified way, and practicing so they can be successful. And then how are they going to behave? Are they going to be primitive and, oh, I don't like this, I'm never going to do it? Are they going to be um, somewhere transitional where they're becoming open to it? Um, and then eventually, can we get them to be mature about it? Okay, so those are all of the adaptive responses, um, the adaptive response pieces.
Okay, next we're going to be talking about our evaluation response subprocess. So this one right here, adaptive response evaluation subprocess. And again, there are two parts. Um, two parts are really simple. Okay, and so I'll just kind of show them here. One, did you do it? Did you complete your occupation? Okay, did you finish it? Yes or no? The other part is the experience of relative mastery. Okay, and again, there's three parts of experience of relative mastery. Efficiency, were you efficient in doing your occupation or did it take you 45 minutes just to tie one shoe? Okay, how effective were you with your one-handed shoe tying technique? Did it just come untied right away? Did your shoe fall off? Okay, how effective were you? And then did you experience satisfaction with yourself? And, and is it appropriate for society? Okay, no shoes, no shirt, no service. Okay, so if your shoe falls off, you can't go into a store. Okay, that's probably not satisfactory to society. And so however you responded adaptively, okay, you can assess it or evaluate it by, did you do it? Yes, I did it. Were you efficient with it? Yes. Was it effective for you? Yes. Are you satisfied with your performance or is society satisfied that you were able to do it? Yes. Great. So again, the adaptive response evaluation piece. So the person is who is evaluating their response in terms of their mastery and the properties. And so again, um, they're assessing the occupational event. Did they complete it or not? Um, and then they're assessing their experience of mastery. So in order to have relative mastery or the efficient, effective, and satisfied. The adaptive response generation or integration subprocess. See, I get confused with all of the adaptive responses, processes, subprocesses. It's a lot of words. Um, this is where the occupational event becomes translated and stored into a form that a person can use in the future. So this occurs after um, they've evaluated how efficient, effective, and satisfied they were. And if they were efficient, effective, and satisfied, okay, they're going to remember that experience. They're going to remember how they were successful. Okay, and so what we can assume is the integration of this adaption, adaptation, requires the person to retain memory of the event from beginning or end. The occupational responses that are evaluated produce either a positive or negative outcome. Um, and even if they have a negative outcome with something, then it's a process. So they're gonna try it again. They're gonna try a different adaptive way. We're gonna help them identify a different adaptive way and we're gonna keep going through that process until we get a positive one, until we increase their adaptive capacity. The action of adaptive response integration transformed into adaptive capacity leads to generalization of the task. Okay, so if we can get them to integrate, excuse me, if we can get them to integrate their responses, integrate their adaption, adaptations, and use adapted methods, we're going to increase their ability to have those adaptive skills. And then in life, when they need to adapt again, they'll be more likely to adapt because they'll have those generalization of those, those, um, those skills, just even the skills of adapting. Like, hey, there is more than one way to put on a pair of socks. Okay, that's increasing their adaptive capacity. OK, 
Okay, so again, we have the adaptive response evaluation subprocess. So they're, they're evaluating, did they do it? Are they happy with it, satisfied with it? Were they efficient? Okay, then it goes into the adaptive response integration subprocess, which we just talked about. So did they get a positive experience or a negative experience? Okay, if they completed everything, they did it. If they felt they were efficient, effective, and satisfied, then yay, right? They, they learned from it. They learned from that adaptation process um, and they can use it then in the future. So then they'll retain that information and it'll come back up here again to the person, okay? And then they'll be able to continue doing that occupation and meeting that occupational challenge adaptively, okay? So, um, may I ask a question? Sure. So can it also work the other way? Could they have a negative experience and say, I'm done, and their adaptive gestalt is shut down? Absolutely. And so that's how this works again also. Okay, so again, if they're not satisfied with it, if they're not able to do it, they're still going to learn from that. They're going to learn, hey, you know what? This sake just is not for me. It does not work for me. I can't get it. I don't have the grip strength for it. I don't like it. Okay, so then the OT has to step in and start this process all over again. Well, let's try maybe another adaptive way on how to do it. Okay, how can we teach the client a different adaptive way? Now let's go through the process here, right, with how much adaptive energy is it going to take? Well, if it's a new task, it's probably going to take a lot of energy. We can, we can probably assume that. Um, where are they at with their adaptive response modes? Okay, where are they at with their adaptive response behaviors? Can we help transition them to a more mature response behavior? Now let's assess it again or have them assess it again because this is internal to the patient, okay? Um, were they effective? Were they not effective? Were they efficient? Maybe they're not efficient, but they're able to physically do it, okay? So they're gonna learn from it. And then when they go through it again and again, they'll probably get stronger, they'll probably get better, they'll probably get a little bit quicker, they'll probably transition from instead of a new mode, right, they'll probably transition to more of a modified mode. Or instead of primary energy where it's just so taxing, the more repetition we can take them through with a as a therapist, it's gonna become more secondary, okay, which then will probably help increase their, their feelings of satisfaction, okay? And so it's, it's a process um, and it's, it's ongoing, okay? So and it's really negative, what I'm gonna say, but can they also learn learned helplessness through the process? I think that's where what we don't want to do. And I think by right. using the OA model and by knowing this adaptive response, right, um, we want to make sure that we're providing them opportunities to adapt in order to be successful. Okay, so mm -hmm. ag again, going on to the the sock aid person who just couldn't have a sock aid, um, wasn't making progress, was getting upset, didn't want to try anything, thought OT was nothing but a salesman and a crook, right? Trying to sell adaptive devices. Um, well, you know what? Then perhaps we take a step back and we say, okay, let's look at their adaptive gestalt. Okay, their sensory motor should be large, but it's really, really small. What are some, um, what are some community resources that would be able to help them with this particular occupation? Okay. Okay. And I guess my question is, so I have a brother who had a stroke and he, he followed learned helplessness and they kept trying to help him adapt, helping him adapt. And he just said, nope, I'm just going to lay down. So then he lost a lot of mobility might lose his leg. Um, so is that the um, press for mastery? I guess that not even, he has to, he's pressed now because he might lose his leg and that's enough motivation. Is that where the motivation sits if they won't change? So the motivation and what's, what's really interesting about this model is um, it assumes that a person has that desire. Okay, it assumes that they're coming into, you know, treatment or intervention with, with a desire 
to do good or with a desire to perform some kind of occupation. And so at some point when they have learned helplessness, they kind of lose that desire for mastery, don't they? Right. Yeah. And so then, you know, you look at somebody that's that far along and how can you take them through the adaptive process if they don't have that desire, right? And so then it probably wouldn't it would. be a good fit. <laughs> okay, okay, that's, and that's my big question. All right, thank you. Yep, yep. Could I ask one quick question that piggybacks onto that, just to clarify sure. a little bit? Sure. So in this model, since it assumes that people have that desire and that motivation, if that desire and motivation isn't evident, does it still assume that it's there and thus like provides techniques for the therapist to prompt that? Or would it just say like this person is broken? Like how would, how would this model respond to people who don't immediately show that motivation? Would it assume they still have it or would it kind of leave them in the dust? Well, I think that's up to us as therapists to try and figure out their motivation. So, you know, for Rachel's brother, maybe the motivation comes now because his motivation is, I don't want to lose my leg, right? And so I think it's, it's motivation may not be eminent right away, right? But motivation may come at another point or with another, with another, another way, okay? So some of my clients that I've had, I'm thinking of like in transitional care, right? I'm in the hospital to sleep. Let me be. You therapists keep bothering me. Get out of my room. I'm watching Days of Our Lives. Don't you dare come back when I'm watching Days of Our Lives, right? They would totally be, um, well, you know, aren't you motivated to get stronger? Hell no. I don't need to go lift weights. I'm not motivated for that, right? Um, oh, well, don't you want to get out of here so you can go home for Thanksgiving with, and spend time with your family? Like, why don't we get you stronger so you can do that? And so I think it's, it's, it can be up to the therapist to try and find that motivational piece, right? And then kind of use that in your therapy. Like, hey, I know now's not a good time. Um, when is Days of Our Lives over? Can I come back then? because I know how badly you want to go home by this time. And so by doing these things, I think we can get you there. I'm confident we can get you there, but I need you to cooperate. And so, I mean, that level of motivation, and I think that level of motivation is, is more highly looked at with the model of human occupation than what it is, you know, in OA. Um, because I think there's some underlying components there right, that, that the model doesn't necessarily talk about as far as the desire. So this model, if we're just looking at this model, that client has a desire for mastery, okay? But in practice, I can tell you it's been sometimes difficult to have that desire for mastery. We've had to find that person's desire for mastery or their motivation. Um, and sometimes that's been a little bit challenging. Um, I also think with pediatrics, I'm thinking of children who may be on the spectrum. Um, sometimes in therapy, we're trying to get them to do things that um, may be appropriate for society, right? Um, like brush their teeth or comb their hair or some of those kinds of things. And, and because of their sensory motor skills um, and their hyper response to some of those things, they're not exactly motivated to do some of those things either. And so as, as therapists, you know, what can we do to help facilitate that desire to help increase their desire for mastery with some of those things? So um, I don't know. It's an interesting, it's an interesting model, isn't it? It, it's, it doesn't, I don't think we, we haven't looked at one that looks so internally at the person and our adaptive, our ability to adapt and respond. Um, so I think that's, helps make this model be really unique. But just to look at it from a process standpoint of these are things that happen, right, in our process. And as therapists, we're usually providing them some level of adaptive or some level of, of occupation in their environment, right? And we're facilitating their adaptive responses. Oh, 
we can't have you get dressed like you used to get dressed because of your hip, right? Let's try it this way. And so that's where the OT is really providing their interventions and then determining how they're responding and taking them through these adaptive responses and then facilitating and asking the client, how'd you do with that? How did that feel? Are you satisfied with that? Great. So you're taking, the th you're taking your client through and internally processing um, and evaluating their overall response in an effort to have that generalize and increase their willingness and ability to adapt. So then when you go up here and start looking at another occupation, they can follow the same process, okay, and keep being more adaptive. Okay. I have 850. You guys ready for a 10 minute break? Perfect. Awesome. I could use one too.
All right. So on our next slide, we've already hit some of these components. Um, but basically, during participation or when they're completing their occupations within the environment, um, they may either have performance breakdown and they may have to do those occupations adaptively um, or they may disadaptively do them. And then it's it's our role as the OT to help help them with their adaptive responses um, so that they can participate in occupations and use what's appropriate for them in the environment. Okay, and, and again, to help facilitate that occupational adaptation process. <clears throat> so your turn, think about um, how do you respond to an occupational challenge? Describe your press for mastery going into your identified occupational challenge. What are the environmental demands? How did your roles um, influence you? Okay, draw out your adaptation gestalt response to your challenge. So how much cognition did you need for your occupation? How much um, psycho, sorry, psychosocial, um, psych, no, sensory motor. Goodness, psychological, cognitive. It was getting mixed up with moho. Imagine that. Um, adaptive response. Okay, how much energy did it take? Did it take more primary energy or secondary energy? What was your response modes or mode? Um, your adaptive response behaviors. Okay, so I'm going to break you up into. Um, just some small groups and we can take about maybe five, 10 minutes just to kind of share um, your internal process here. And go.
All right. Anybody have any examples they want to share that they heard? Any good examples that kind of um, really facilitated this process? I can share if you want me to. Sure. Um, actually, our whole group did a great job. Um, we went through all of us and we found that this model um, fit all of us really well and we could run through it and it's understandable to us. Anyway, so for me, um, it's, it's moving here, it's having COVID, it's leaving my three kids, it's not having a support system and going to school three days and not being able to like create um, to really get to know anybody really well because you know we all had a mask on and it's all new anyway so um for me the um being really sick for so long because you can put me in the group of long haulers where it's just taking forever to get over it but um since remoter i've been affected with um not being able to to move like i want to not being able to exercise which is a great outlet um, cognitive, I've ex been experiencing, you know, that just shuts your body down. But later, um, brain fog, psychosocial, uh, it's really hard on you to keep, to be sick for so long and have a new thing happen and a new thing happen and a new thing happen. Um, so my adaptive responses is, um, I've had to, let's see if I do this right. So I already went through the gestalt part, the constructs, my adaptive energy. I tried the primary one where it's like, well, I am not feeling like I used to where I can just sit there and study for hours and just knock stuff out. And it just wasn't working. And um, so then I had to adapt um, my response and instead um, try this new one where it's like, I'm just gonna get up, I'm gonna try and I'm gonna do a really bad job in my opinion and um, just wait for everything to start to come back. So then there was a modification. And then um, now I am feeling more like a human and um, I'm, I'm getting back into it. But it's teaching me to be a better OT because I'm understanding how difficult that um, psychological part is. And then also the part where I'm just used to doing it this way and having my body feel a certain way and it's uh, and my mind also, and it's not just there. So I can have more patience, I guess, with um, those that I'm gonna be working with. Very good. Thank you for sharing. And yes, it's all about our capacity to adapt, right? Now, don't forget, we have the environment side also, right? So we've been dealing with the person and what's going internally in the person and taking them through that adaptive response and evaluating themselves and how they're doing and how it worked. But we also have the environmental side, okay? And so um, once that person responds or attempts to complete their occupation or they have that occupational response, then we assess um, the occupational environment. Did the environment help the person succeed? Okay, and so did the environment um, give us everything that was expected to perform? So were our expectations, were the client's expectations met in the environment? Okay, um, if not, okay, then we move to incorporation into an occupational environment. And so that's where you either can say, okay, let's try and modify the environment versus, no, nope, the environment was great. It, it, it met our needs, it met our expectations, um, we can keep them the same. And so <clears throat> just to help facilitate this and to give this an understanding, Okay, we're back to this old diagram. Okay, so once we have that occupational response, okay, they've completed that occupation and they're going through their evaluation pieces, right, themselves and how they did, we're also looking at the assessment of the response. Okay, so the overall outcome, 
with the environment? Were the expectations met with the environment? Did the environment um, meet our expectations for their performance? Okay. We move up to the incorporation into the occupational environment, which again, we have self-care environment, we have play leisure environment, we have work environment, because those are our three occupations. Can we modify the environment in any way? That would, that would um, give them more opportunity to engage in their occupations and fulfill their roles just by changing an aspect of the environment or modifying the environment, would that change their occupational response? Now let's assess it again. Did that adaptation of the environment meet our challenge or meet the response of our clients? Okay, can we modify it again or are we okay? No change needed. Let's go back up to, he, up to the occupational environments, right? And the occu occupations, were they able to fill the role? So again, we've got two processes going on here, right? We've got the client completing occupations, learning and becoming okay, adapting to those occupations and evaluating their own performance. And then we have the environment going on at the same time. Okay, anybody Karate Kid fans, wax on, wax off, right? That's what I feel like I'm, I'm doing right now. Anyway, so there's two processes going on here. And that's, again, that really, this diagram really helps me um, make sense of everything that's going on simultaneously with this model. So again, I have a blank one for you. I have this one filled out for you as well. I hope you find it as helpful um, as I did. <clears throat> and so this is this is fascinating to me that that having the client actually engage in occupation is what is empowering them to learn that adaptive response okay so we can look at perhaps occupational readiness. So sometimes some clients, you know, if they just have a hip replacement or something like that, we can't just say, hey, here we go. We're throwing you to the wolves. Let's, you know, go practice car transfers or let's go do this. Let's go do that. They may be in a lot of pain. They may be throwing up out of anesthesia. They may need some preparatory activities or to work on some performance skills, but eventually, right, eventually we want them to be strong enough or, or um, ready to engage in those full occupations, okay? Because it's the occupation that takes them through that adaptation and makes them um, have the ability to change. Um, it's the occupation that actually elicits that adaptive response. And this is, this is what's fascinating to me. The client is the one who is the agent of change. So it's not necessarily the OT saying, you need to do this occupation, do it now. But instead, it's the therapist who is helping the client figure out what occupations are meaningful to them, right? What they're motivated for, um, finding out how do they navigate their challenges. And it's the OT that's more asking questions to the client to help them evaluate their performance and get their ideas um, for how they're adapting. And so the client is who is changing that, right? And it's the therapist who is an agent of the environment. So we are just a component of the environment asking questions to our client to take them through this evaluative process. Okay, now the therapist, um, we have really good um, skills, skill sets, and knowledge about how important the environment is, right? And so um, as OTs, we can skillfully identify how the environment can be used to facilitate adaptation um, and help the client do this, okay? And so OTs, we should avoid doing um, or being the fixer, right? Like um, we're more so trying to get the client to be the agent of change for themselves and we're not supposed to just go in and fix it or fix their environment, but help them, um, help them 
evaluate and assess it in order to reestablish their roles, increase their mastery um, and their ability to adapt for long term. Just some other components, relative mastery is just how effective they participate, how well they achieve their goals. Um, efficiency is just being able to um, have available resources within their environment. Um, satisfaction, um, the extent to which people are content um, with their performances. And so we kind of touched on those um, when we talked about um, adaptive response evaluation subprocess. How's that for a mouthful? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Sorry, I'm talking a lot today. Um, could you give an example of not being a fixer as an OT? So this process um, is looking more at um, helping our client understand their adaptive energy, their adaptive response modes, right? And saying, okay, you're looking like maybe you're, um, you're frustrated, you know, just remember this is something new. Um, you're going to have to give it some time. Let's keep practicing. Let's, um, could you think of a different way um, that might work for you? Instead of me saying, try this way, right? Which is, I mean, totally my style. I'm sorry. So it's why I struggle a little bit with this model. Try it this way, you know, being a little more directive. But this model is saying, okay, how is that working for you, right? Did you complete your occupation? No. Why not? Were you efficient? Was it not effective for you? You weren't satisfied with it? Okay, well, is there anything else that we could try? What else would you like to try? Okay, is there anything in your environment you think that we could add um, that might help you be more safe and independent? Okay, and so we're more so that agent of, of facilitating change and trying to get our client to think for themselves on how they can adapt their environment and how they can adapt um, in learning new skills. Does that kind of make sense? So we're not saying like, and I, and I struggle with this because so many times in acute care, it's like, you need a bath chair. <laughs> like, let's practice with the bath chair. You need one. <laughs> it's okay. Your daughter said she's going to pick it up for you. Perfect. Right. And so instead, you know, in a different type of, of, you know, using this model, it isn't necessarily like that per se. It's more so trying to get them to think for themselves and to facilitate that. Thank you. Yes, again, I, I, I struggle with this one a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so with adaptive capacity, it's their perceived ability, right, or their perception about how they're doing in their environment, okay? So how they're doing with their ability to adapt. And so really, we just want our clients to be satisfied and happy, right? And again, I'm going to go back to that Moho um, video where that lady, um, oh, what was her name? I think she had MS. She was in the chair. She wanted to go out and cut okra, right? Um, I can't remember her name. She's my favorite one in the whole wide world. But her adaptive capacity, she was satisfied. She could go out there and she could cut that okra. Uh -huh. I love her little giggle at the end, <laughs> right? And so somebody else, maybe with that same type of diagnosis, that same type of thing, may say, I could only cut one okra, and I, I, it took, I was not efficient in it. I was, it took me forever. Like, I don't care if I ever do that again. It was awful, right? But she had that, that desire of doing that, and she was able to perform that, and she was able to adapt by, by moving her arm over like like this remember she when she was explaining that and she cut that okra okay and so you know that's that's that adaptive capacity too is is her perception of how well she did and and she thought she did very well with that okay and she was excited about that and so <clears throat> We want our clients, and these are tools for our toolbox, we want our clients to be able to generalize that adaptive response, right? So if we can teach them 
going through these different response processes and sub processes and taking them through the process of how to adapt to their environment, how to adapt their occupation, they should be able to generalize that over other occupations and other contexts. Um, that way we're not just teaching them about one occupation, we're teaching them how to problem solve um, so they can be more independent and work more so within their environment. Okay. Um, we're trying to teach them and, and increase their comfort level with creating new strategies and tools um, for their occupational challenges that they face. And so when we're going through and when we're using OA, some of the clinical reasoning steps we have, um, who is the person? Okay, how do they experience the demand for mastery? What is their environment? Okay, what is their occupational environment? Um, what's the performance needed for that demand? What does the client experience? What's the actual press that's going on from the environment to their desire for mastery? And then what is their overall adaptation process? Okay, are they kind of stuck with their, with their um, old way of doing things? And are they having a difficult time adapting? Okay, and so those are the clinical reasoning steps that we can take um, and we can identify when we are um, conducting our evaluation. So model overview, unique strength or unique qualities, strengths, challenges to use, applicable populations, any given treatment settings. Um, let's just take a couple minutes here and I wanna hear, I wanna hear from you guys. What are you thinking? about any any of these things. Hi, uh, so I think one of the strengths of this one, how it focuses it folks uh, mostly like the internal person, uh, like a great deal about with their like motivation. I think that's really important and then seeing how it works side by side with the environment I feel like that's a really big strength of this model for a strength I think this model would be really good for populations that have had a significant change in their life and now they have to work through that change so maybe something like a, a stroke patient or onset of disease where things have been modified significantly. Um, one of the challenges to use, I think, would be in a population where they don't have the skill set to think of ideas um, of how to fix their problem. Like they don't know about adaptive devices yet that they could use and they actually need an OT or someone else to say, how about you try this instead of them trying to problem solve it by themselves. Yeah, that's a that's a big one I think of too. And and that's part of where I struggle um, and I have struggled with this model and I'm thinking looking at treatment settings like acute care where we have just a few days to work with somebody and we have to okay what do you need to do when you get home um, and you know they may have just an acute surgery right where they have to have just a few days of healing and stability um, before we can even look at um, some adaptive ways of adapted ways of doing things, and um, I can I can anticipate that in that kind of a setting because that's just the setting and the nature of the setting. Um, but I can't imagine like just having a post acute, you know, hip replacement and saying, "What do you need, Betty?" <laughs> like, oh, how come you can't crawl over that tub? You got something like hip precautions? So I feel like, you know, some of the treatment settings, um, I think, you know, that acute care setting would be really hard. Um, I think that could be really hard. Now, there's, <clears throat> excuse me, some rehab hospitals 
or surgeons that partner with OTs um, and they actually will go through um, the OT will actually do some pre-surgical education with them. And so when I think about that, um, I, think, I think there may be an opportunity um, for using this model for that kind of a setting, right? Where, um, okay, here are your hip precautions. How do you anticipate navigating your bathroom? Right? Can you show me? Can you show me how you think that's going to work for you? What are you thinking? What are some of your thoughts on this and that? Right? Because essentially, then after surgery, um, they might get a day of OT and then they might go home. And so they're getting more of that, that training um, even before their surgery, right? While they're cognizant and those kinds of things. And we're trying to teach them how to teach themselves how to adapt. Right, and teaching them that adaptive process. I think, again, going back to um, this, was, this was created by a PhD program, right, for structuring a PhD program in OT. And so I think of um, what you guys must go through with adapting to like online learning and this type of lecture and that type of lecture and this type of lab and just your overall responses. Um, to all of those, I think are explained quite nicely in your adaptive response, in your adaptive response modes, um, all of those things. And so I, I think I go back to um, education. One of my DEC students actually is using the OA model. He's doing his DEC um, in higher education, um, and he is using the OA model to sort of guide how he how he is going to move through. Um, that setting. So I think, I think that's interesting. Um, and that will be interesting. Um, let's see if I had any other points. I think challenges too. I think it's difficult. OT, we're looking for outcome measures, right? We're looking at measuring things. How can you measure somebody's internal process? Right? I think it's a little tricky. It's doable because you can um, observe them with their occupations and their performance and you can ask them questions. Um, it's just a different, it's just, it's just a little bit different than what we've seen before. Um, I think a strength would be um, if we can teach the client to, to problem solve for themselves, think of how empowering that is. Right, so I think this could really help empower the client to take charge of their life and take charge of their um, their environment and their capabilities. So, I mean, I think certainly some some pros and cons here. Um, any questions for the good for the good of the cause? Okay, so to help sort of influ or help this gel a little bit, I came up with this activity. Now there's certain cases in your in your book too, and I wanted to do this a little bit differently. Um, so I try to take the main components of this model, like person, environment, occupation, um, different challenges, and take you through the different aspects um, of this model. Since it is so internal, right, and that internal process, I thought it would be a little bit better, a little bit more cohesive um, for you guys to go through this again in small groups. So just in your small group, choose an occupation that you do either either for work, leisure, self-care. Describe that environment, okay, looking at those subsystems. Um, how do you interact with your environment? Does the chosen occupation, how does that contribute to your roles? Okay, so I have some very specific questions, uh, making sure that we're hitting and targeting each of the main concepts of the OA model, okay? So I'm going to, let's see here, 30, 9, 36, 46. Let's give you about 10 minutes. I'll kind of jump in um, to see how you guys are doing. Um, and then here are just some reflective questions.
<laughs> Casey did some remodeling. <laughs> Hello. Did I not get put in the breakout group? <laughs> um. Do you remember which number you were in before? Oh, sorry. Hang on. My my volume was down because I was my roommate. Sorry. What'd you say? Do you remember what one you were in before? Yeah, I was with Ashley and Morgan. Ashley and Morgan. Ashley um, Morgan. Morgan. Rep. Here we go. Breakout three. Let's try this. Thank oh, you. wait, 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 wait. Did you get invited? No, um, I got it right here, right here. How's it going? <laughs> I was like, oh, is that an accident or what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> no, just wanting to bounce in and see how your discussion's going. Yeah, Pretty well. <laughs> We're, we are just talking about like going to school to become a doctorate in OT. Mm -hmm. So we're just going along that. Um, let's see. So for like the cultural environment, we talked about like showing up to class and like doing the work. Is that kind of on the right path for that or not really? Sure, sure. Yep. any rules of the road that are used to follow? Um, you know, I think showing up to class on time, passing exams, right? Looking at the policies of needing to get a 73% or higher. So then, mm -hmm. you know, how does that impact your occupations, right? Well, you have to study, you have to read, you have to attend class, you have to um, probably look somewhat presentable in class too, right? It's part of our culture here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, I really haven't gotten too far yet. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'll keep bebopping around.
become my workstation. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. And then so I'm just kind of modifying it to be comfortable in a virtual world. Yeah, in your school life. <laughs> yeah. Because it's just nice, I guess. I don't know. The only thing I do in my room is sleep. <laughs> yeah, try to keep sleep and school separate. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Part <laughs> of <over> Zoom world. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, uh, what else? I think, I, think, I think environment being culture, you've kind of adapted to like a virtual communication or that virtual kind of, you know, connection. Yeah. Just don't don't complain about it or get separated. <laughs> I feel yeah, so bad for the to- person that brought that question up. Oh, yeah. Um, let's see. How does the chosen occupation contribute to your roles? I mean, well, we're a student, and that's our main role. <laughs> that is huge. It's <laughs> like three years. Yeah. Um, just pretty much involves around studying and trying to get good grades. I guess that's, mm-hmm. there's not anything else really. Um, how does your occupation require sensory motor, cognitive, and psychosocial skills? Let's see. Well, your, your psychosocial skills definitely adapt you to the school's culture, right? Especially with the faculty. Like, we're learning. I mean, there's, with the exception of Dr. Sandvig, um, their generation is further oh. from them. And so you're going to, there's a process of adapting of, you know, like we're saying about joking and then asking questions that kind of, you know, maybe, maybe her response came from, you know, uncomfortable with the technology. So there, there's, there's a bunch of things there that would be one of the psychosocial skills. Yeah. So as your, as your student occupations, right, how much in relation to the other components do you need? So if I'm drawing a circle, right, how much psychosocial do you need in relation to um, cognition in relation to sensory motor? So how much sensory motor are you guys using? Like a lot, a little right now? Oh, a little. Okay, yeah. a little typing, that kind of thing. Yeah. Right. You're in a breakout room, so you're probably interacting pretty socially right now, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, are you learning from each other? Yeah, I'd say yeah. Uh, sharing our different views helps us see different sides of it, and so you, okay. yeah, you learn. So cognitive. So here would be your occupational gestalt. Okay. Okay, so it's a pie, right? And the the sliver up on top is going to be your sensory motor because you're not using that much sensory motor skills Mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. But instead, you're using probably, you know, more cognitive and more psychosocial skills right now. So this is what your occupational gestalt looks like in relation to your occupation of being in class right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah. And you do that for every, like when you use this model, you try to do that pie like shape yep. every time to try to figure out the proportions? Yes. Okay. Yep. All right, I'm gonna check on another group here. Okay. Good discussions. <laughs> All right, it looks like everybody's back. And so how far did you get with your discussion? Did you get through most of the things? 
not really. Okay. I jumped in on one conversation um, where we were talking about the um, adaptation gestalt, right? And looking at the occupation of being a student and, and fulfilling that role and being in class, right? And so during that breakout session, right, we looked at um, that adaptation gestalt. So I drew a circle. I don't know if you can see it really good here, probably not. Okay, I drew a circle. And then I had to decide how much sensory motor skills were being used at that time. Very, very little. Some people were maybe writing down some notes, um, listening, you know, surely. Um, but most of the most of the items that were being used was cognitive, and I know this is probably backwards on my screen. And so I split the circle in just a little tiny sliver of sensory motor. And then since there were discussions going on, there was that psychosocial element. And then there also was a learning element taking place too. And so this was our occupational gestalt that we came up with um, for, our, for our class. So just to kind of facilitate what this means and what this looks like. Okay, so it helps us then to determine as therapists, or it helps us determine then um, what's being used, what is the person using in relation to those tasks, okay, to get them ready to go through their adaptive responses. Are there any questions or any, any words of, of wisdom or any aha moments? Any happy Halloween plans? <laughs> All right. I know this is a tougher model to go through, you guys. Thank you for being rock stars. And um, you guys have a great weekend. Thank you.